Well, we're back this week in James chapter 4. We are looking again at the issue of prayer as we examine the uh, practical nature of the Christian life and the practical nature of the epistle of James. And we want to look at the text that we started to look at last week in James chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. We'll look at all of verse 2 and 3 even though we're really going to only zoom in on part of verse 2. God says, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. There's something about prayer that is at odds with our instincts as human beings. We saw last week as we talked about this same text and we talked about Abraham's servant and the job that he was given. Abraham, as he is advancing in years and he knows that his time on earth is coming to an end, he sees that his son Isaac is without a spouse. And he knows a spouse is crucial, not just because of the necessity of fulfilling the custom of the day, that you need to, you need to get your boy married off and secure your family line, uh, but all of the promises of God to Abraham are dependent on whether or not Isaac gets married. And Abraham communicates to his servant and says, I need you to go back to my homeland where I came from and find a woman for this boy to marry. Just promise me you won't make him marry somebody from here, one of the Canaanite women. And so the uh, servant sets off and he goes uh, across the desert to the land where Abraham came from. And he gets to this land and as we talked about last week, he gets there and he sees all of these potential brides. What would you do? What, what is your instinct when there is a pressing issue? Here, we're talking about the issue of marriage. There are people in this room, I'm sure, who would like to be married and aren't. There are people in uh, this room who used to not be married and wanted to be. And I trust that now that you are married, you know what you were missing uh, before you got that way. But whether you need to think about what you're doing as someone who would like to be married or what you did as someone who wanted to be married before you were, what did you do? Our instinct when we're confronted with need as human beings is to plan and to plot. We got to figure out, we got to come up with a strategy to make this happen. Whether it's uh, work our friendships and our relationships to death to try to find a spouse or whether it's online dating or whether it's behavior that's getting close to being a stalker as we uh, chase people that we think might be or ought to be interested in us. Our, our instinct is to plot and plan. Our instinct is to worry, to, to wring our hands over what's going to happen if this doesn't happen? What's going to happen if the plan doesn't work out? What's going to happen if I never find somebody? And that's just one issue, the issue of marriage that's on the face of the example that we looked at last week. There are all sorts of other issues. When there's trouble at work, when there's trouble with the bank account, when there's trouble in the marriage you've got, when there's car trouble, when we confront the issues of human need, our human instinct is to work and plot and plan and worry and get angry and to spin our wheels, to get on the hamster wheel of human effort to see if we can't make this thing happen. That's not 
the instinct of Abraham's servant. Abraham's servant, that Jewish tradition identifies as Eliezer, looks around and he gets on his knees and he asks the Lord, Lord, would you make clear who the wife of my servant is to be? Would you be faithful to Abraham? Would you be faithful to Isaac? Would you be faithful to your promise and make clear to me who this woman ought to be? He defies human sinful instinct and he asks the Lord for help. It's the same thing that this text tells us to do. You don't have because you don't ask. It doesn't say you don't have because you didn't plot and plan. It doesn't say you don't have because you didn't come up with the strategy. It doesn't say you don't have because you didn't outsmart everybody you know. It says you don't have because you did not ask God. Now, as we saw last week, this is not a guarantee that just because you ask, that you will get what you want. In fact, the guarantee in the text is there are some prayers that the Lord will not answer. The text is very clear that if you ask and you ask to spend it on your pleasures, if you ask with wrong motives, you can guarantee you will not get what you want. The guarantee of the text is that there are some things you can ask for that God will not answer. But we need to say more than that when it comes to this text you don't have because you don't ask. We need to also say that there are some things you can ask for that God will often answer. There's some things you can ask for that God will never answer when you ask with wrong motives. But there are some things that you can ask for that God will often answer answer after the proper motive is in place after you have by the grace of Jesus crucified your flesh and you have sought the Lord asking him for things that aren't just to perpetuate your own good but after you're pursuing his glory and the good of others then there are things that you can and should ask for and God loves it when you do that. The whole point of the text is to let you know that God loves it when you ask for things. God loves it. When you look around at your life and you determine some particular need, some particular want, and then you look around and you see that you don't have the resources to provide that particular need or that particular want for yourself. And then you keep looking and you behold the God of heaven and earth who does have the resources to provide the need and the want. And then you don't just see that he has the resources, the power to give it, but you see that he would have the desire to give it. That's what this text is about. It's about you being in need and coming to God who has the power and the love for you to give what you ask. That is what God wants you to experience. It's a God who has power and love to answer your prayers. When you come to God, looking around at your life, and you see that you're in desperate need of something, or you see that you have a strong desire for something, and you know he can provide it, and you know he loves to provide it, you are supposed to ask for those things. And when you ask for those things, whatever they are, as long as the motives are right, God will often answer yes. God will often answer yes. I want you to think about Joshua chapter 10. We're going to look there in just a minute. It's a fascinating passage. Uh, just to catch up on the history of Joshua chapter 10. 
the Israelites have come into the land of promise. God has bailed them out of Egypt after almost a half a millennium of captivity. He has carried them through the wilderness. He has led them over the Jordan, and now they are in the land. And as they are taking over the land in the book of Joshua, there's all sorts of things that are going on. One of the things that's going on is this group of people called the Gibeonites. They realize uh, God is on the side of these Israelites. And we can't go to war with these people and win. And they're taking over all this land. So what are we going to do? Well, what they do is they trick the Israelites. They get dressed up in uh, garbagey clothes and they put some crumbly bread and they empty out their canteens and they ride up on horses just a few miles away and they say, hey, we've come from this really far country. We know that the Lord is with you. We know that you're taking over this land and we just want to enter into a treaty with you that we won't hurt one another. And long story short, the Israelites say, sure, why not? And then after they sign the deal, they say, oh, guess what? We just live down the street. We were just kidding about that uh, long journey thing. Well, there's all sorts of things that happen as a result of that unwise deal that they made without seeking the Lord. But one of the bad things that happens to the Gibeonites is all of the villages around the Gibeonites get ticked off with these guys. And they say, these guys just made a treaty with the Israelites. And so five villages come together and attack the Gibeonites. Well... The Gibeonites send a letter. They're not pretending to take a long time now. They send a letter to the Israelites and they say, hey guys, guess what? We need to uh, invoke the terms of that treaty. Uh, we're being beaten up by these uh, five villages. Won't you come and help? And so Joshua gathers an army together and goes up to fight the Gibeonites. Uh, for, that goes up to fight for the Gibeonites. And as he gets there, he engages these five villages and it starts to be a total rout. And all five kings and all the troops start running. God sends hailstones down out of the sky. Uh, people are getting squashed by rocks falling from the air. They're getting killed by the sword. And it's such a rout that it keeps going. The Israelites are killing them with the sword as they chase them. And as they continue in victory, Joshua asks God for something. He makes one of the most unbelievable requests in all of Scripture. He says, God, would you stop the sun? Would you pause the rotation of the planet so that we can continue our victory? And in Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 to 14, this is what it says. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O son, stand still. At Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ajalon, so the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jashar? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like it. That before it or after it, when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. God stopped the earth from spinning. God stopped the moon from twirling. God brought the entire cosmos to a stop because one man asked for it. 
Now, it's a crazy request. <laughs> That's a crazy request. Think of all the things Joshua could have prayed. God, would you just see to it that they don't ever come back this way again? God, would you give us great speed so that we kill them all before the sun goes down? I mean, we're doing a pretty good job here. There's a lot of swords and a lot of hail falling from the sky. Would you, would you hit fast forward so that all these people are dead so that we can just go to bed and sleep? He could have prayed that and a hundred other things, but he said, God, would you stop the sun? And God said, yes. God said yes. Why? Because God loves to listen to the voice of a man. God loves to answer prayer. One of the reasons this text is in Scripture is to keep you from ever saying there's anything too big for you to ask God. What is the thing that you would love the Lord to do? Ask. Ask Him for it. He made the sun stand still for his servant Joshua. Ask him for what you would like him to do and see what he does. When you ask God for great big things like a wife or a wife for your son or like the sun standing still, don't be surprised when he very, very often says, sure, here you go. Because he loves you. And he loves it when you know that you love him. So there are times when we ask God for things that he often says yes. But there's also times when we ask God for things and he says no. You think of another example in scripture. You think of the apostle Paul. The great Apostle Paul. After Jesus Christ, there is no human being on the face of planet earth more responsible for the spread of the gospel than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was the recipient of untold blessings from God. One of the blessings that the Apostle Paul received was a miraculous vision that he got from God. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he was carried up into a layer of heaven and he saw things that he could not utter, things no man had ever beheld. He talked about the overwhelming nature of these visions that God had given him to see. Nobody saw the things the apostle Paul saw. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, I can't even tell you what I saw. They are so wonderful. And as he sees these wonderful, glorious things, there's a threat. And the threat is maybe the great Apostle Paul who has received visions that nobody has ever received. Maybe this guy is going to get too big for his britches. Maybe he's going to get proud. And so the Bible makes clear that to keep him from being prideful because of all the gifts he had received, he got a thorn in the flesh. We're not told what the thorn is, but it caused him great difficulty. It caused him immense pain. And he begged God to take it away. Not once, not twice, but three times. And we read what happened in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 9. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations... For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. The Apostle Paul doesn't just ask God for something. He begs him. And he doesn't just beg him, but he begs him repeatedly. God, please take away this horrible, painful thorn. God, please take away this horrible affliction. God, won't you please take away this thorn in the flesh? And God says, no. Let that sink in. The Apostle Paul begged for a break. Just just one little thing. One really good thing. And God said no. Joshua, another great guy, asked for an insane thing. A crazy thing. And God said, sure. You want me to stop the sun in the sky? Here you go. Pause on the universe. You want a thorn out of your flesh? No. No, Paul. Joshua's account is in the Bible to keep you from thinking there's anything too big for you to ask God to do for you. Paul's account is in the Bible to keep you from thinking that God is at your beck and call. And Paul's account is also in the Bible to remind us that God can say no and still love you. God can say no and still be for you. The Apostle Paul could not have known how mightily he was being used by the Lord. The Apostle Paul could not have known that 2,000 years later in Jacksonville, Florida, we'd be talking about him right now. He just knew it hurt. He just knew he needed a break. Except he was wrong. He didn't need a break. He needed something better that God had for him. And so what's the difference between God's yes and God's no. The difference between God's yes and God's no is not God's love. Do you believe that? The difference between God's yes to your prayer and God's no to your prayer is not God's love for you. That's not what it is. The difference between God's yes and God's no is God's wisdom about what you need. He's not going to keep anything good from you. He just knows what you need more than you do. And think about this. If you don't agree with that, then you don't trust God. You just trust yourself. You think you know what you need more than God knows what you need. When God answers no, he doesn't want us to distrust him. He wants us to know and to confess that he does love us and that he knows what is best. But here's the thing. Whether he answers no or whether he answers yes, he still wants you to ask. Because the whole point of this text is there are some things that you could have that you don't have because you didn't ask for them. Whether God says yes or God says no, he wants you to ask. This week, we were on the way to school and the boys were uh, having an argument about a buck fifty, one dollar and fifty cents. And uh, it was uh, a veritable tirade about uh, these precious precious amounts of money. And one of the things that we talk about in our house all the time, whether it's money or Legos or video games or iPads or whatever it is, one of the things that we always talk about in our house is it's people that are important, not things. We don't go to war over things. We care for people. And so I'm always putting little faces in my hands and going, hey, 
I've, I've held up Legos and coins and pieces of paper, and I got a face in my hand and a dollar bill in my hand. I'm saying, hey, one of these things is going to be sitting around the Thanksgiving table in 20 years, and one of them isn't. Which one is it going to be? Well, it's going to be this, this little cute face right here. One of these is made in the image of God, and one of them isn't. Which one is it? One of them has a soul that will never die, and one of them doesn't. Which one is it? So we're talking about this all the time, and I'm incredulous that we're having this kind of drama over $1.50. And I said, look, guys, I don't want you to fight about money in our house. If you want money, I'll give you money. How much is it going to take? If you want $1.50, I'll give you $1.50. You want $10? You want $20? How much is it going to take to get you to realize that the money isn't important? And it got real quiet, and they said, Dad, we don't, we don't want any money. And I sat there, and we were at a stoplight, and I was just looking back and forth. And as that sunk in in the quiet, Chloe's voice comes from the back. And she says, Dad, can I have $10? (laughs) You got to have a little bit of respect for that, right? My little girl did not know whether she was going to get $10 or not, but she knew she could ask me. Do you see, you should approach God as your father who loves to give you good things, and you can't presume whether he's going to say yes or no, but you can know that he loves it when you ask. And you can trust that whether he says yes or whether he says no, he's going to work for your good. There are some things that you can ask for that God will often answer. And then finally, there are some things you can ask that God will always answer. There are some things that you can ask that God will always answer. Here's a guarantee. It's the most precious reality in the whole universe. When you ask for Jesus, God will always give you Jesus. Amen. You might not get a buck fifty, you might not get ten bucks, you might not get the wife you want, you might not get the job you want, you might not have the relationships you want, but when you ask for Jesus, God will always give him to you. If you ask for Jesus in order to be saved, God will give you Jesus and will save you. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. When We've all been in eternity 10,000 years. There won't be anybody who's not in heaven because God blocked them from heaven. The only people who won't be in heaven are the people who don't ask. Because when you ask for Jesus to be saved, God will always say yes. Because whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then after you're saved, whether you're having trouble with your marriage or trouble with your singleness or trouble with your work or trouble with your money or whatever it is, as a Christian, when you plead with God for the grace of Jesus to endure, God will always give you the grace of Jesus to endure. He will never say no. He doesn't even know how. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, listen to this. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
When you go to the throne of God where Jesus Christ is seated and you ask for mercy and grace, Jesus gives you mercy and grace. You might die. You might go broke. You might get fired. You might get divorced. But Jesus will give you his grace. He will show up and be there for you because there's no place else he wants to be. There is no prayer for Jesus that Jesus would consider not answering. But we've got to ask. We've got to ask for Jesus. And when we ask for Jesus, we'll get Jesus. This is a text that urges us to fly to God for the things that we need. It's a text that reminds us that the thing we need the most is Jesus. It's a text that encourages us that God will provide what we need and he loves to provide what we need when we ask. But there's one thing we ought to remember as we ask. And Abraham's servant reminds us of that too. As we read last week, Lord, would you cause the woman who comes up to me and doesn't just give me a drink, but the camels a drink, would you cause her to be the wife of my servant? And the text says, before he even stopped praying, Rebecca walked up. Now think about that. We know something, because we're reading the Bible, that Eliezer didn't know back then. I mean, he sees this woman coming up, and I'm just telling you, he wondered, is this, is this for real? I mean, this is the girl. And she, she answered the question, but is this, is this going to work, Lord? And then he follows her home, and he sits in her house, and he has to talk to her dad about it. Hey, uh, funny story, Uh, I'm from a long way away on the other side of the desert, and uh, my master would like a wife, and you know, it seems pretty reasonable that your daughter would come over with me, and uh, they'd get hitched. What do you think? (laughs) And Laban says, okay. And then he says, okay, but here's the thing, I want to take her right now. And Laban says, well, I don't know about that. And he says, well, I have to take her right now. And Laban says, well, let's ask her. And so then he pitches her the deal. How about this whole thing where you marry my servant? How about we go do that right now? You load up your camels, we cross the desert, and you go right now. And she says, okay. (laughs) And, And then they saddle up the donkeys and the camels, and they walk across the desert. And he's going, what is, is this the girl? What happens if Isaac sees her and he thinks she's ugly? or not funny, or weird, or not his taste. And they have to make this long, weeks-long journey with him wondering how this thing is going to pan out before Isaac finally sees her and they fall in love and then finally they get married. In between the servant's prayer and the marriage There would have been months of waiting. He could not possibly have known what we know from reading the account that the prayer got answered the second he was through. This gives us confidence, not just to know the difference between God's yeses and God's noes, but to trust in our good and loving God that sometimes his yeses are yeses before we even know they are. And to always remember that some of the prayers that God answers, he often answers very slowly, but he only answers them after we ask. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that we can have Jesus for the asking. Whether we need him for the first time to be saved or we need him for the thousandth time to grow in grace as a Christian. Father, thank you that you don't want to just provide for us 
but that you want to provide for us in the context of a relationship where we come to you in love and trust and talk to you about what we need. And so, Father, here's my request tonight. I ask that there would be men and women and young people in this room who would be saved. I ask that they would ask for the forgiveness of their sins and that they would trust in Jesus Christ for the very first time. And Father, I ask for my brothers and sisters in this room that in the midst of asking for a million different things that are good and right, that tonight, for now, right now, they would stop asking for the thing they want and ask you in the midst of what they want, in the midst of what they need, to give them Jesus in the midst of it. Whether it's trouble in marriage, trouble in work, trouble in some relationship, trouble with money, trouble with a car. Father, I'm asking you that my brothers and sisters would stop asking you for the thing and would ask you for Jesus in the midst of what they need. And Father, I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we stand and respond, this time of response is for you. And perhaps you have never before tonight asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and trusted that because of his life and his death and his resurrection, you can be forgiven. If that's you, then this time of response is for you. There's going to be people down front and in the back who want to talk to you about that. And perhaps you're in a season of need in your life, and it is good and right that you would ask God for things. But right now, as I'm asking the Lord, I'm praying that you would see that what you need is not the thing out there, but Jesus Christ. And so if you want to talk with someone in here tonight about that, then these people in front and in the back are here for you as well. And so let's respond to Jesus as we continue in worship. I hear the Savior say, thy strength.